Scotland. You want to get out of here. And I need to get out of here. Bring me what I want. What's that? Any stunt they would allow me to do, and most stunts they wouldn't allow me to do, I did. <laughs> I don't care who this guy is. I just lost so much time. The imagination runs wild. He's a monster who thinks he's a god. I thought I was going to get fired. Everything you call a life, I will burn out of time. It was magical. It was enchanting. You think you can beat me? Den femte fase af Marvels enorme MCU-saga blev kickstartet af selskabets mindste superhelt, Ant-Man. Thank you, Spider-Man! I Marvel-heltens seneste eventyr rejser han ind i det såkaldte kvanterige, et mikroskopisk univers dybt begravet i vores eget... Hvor den ondskabsfulde Kang the Conqueror regerer med hård hånd. Og sammen med sin datter og svigermekanikken må Ant-Man forsøge at overvinde skurken og finde en vej hjem. You thought you could win. Netop Kang er en af Marvel-historiens helt store superskurke, og han er udset til at være den gennemgående trussel i de kommende års Marvel-film. Han bliver spillet af stjernefrøet Jonathan Majors, som på rekordtid er blevet et brandvarmt navn i Hollywood. Blandt andet takket være midtiværdige præstationer i kritikeroste film som Devotion, og også hans indsats i Marvel-serien Loki, hvor i han spillede en alternativ udgave af Kang fra et andet univers. Vi har interviewet Majors. Oh man, I didn't know it was you. I didn't know it was you. I you didn't know it was me? I would have changed my clothes. I would have been, I would have been prepared. I would have been more focused. <laughs> Og vi har også talt med tre af hans prominente kollegaer foran kameraet. Yes! Evangeline Lilly er tilbage som The Wasp, Ant-Mans bedre halvdel, og i sig selv en karismatisk, hårdslående held med et fantastisk outfit. You ready? Ready. Lilly er dog nok stadig bedst kendt for sin rolle som den heroiske Kate i tv-sensationen Lost. Den 26-årige Catherine Newton er til gengæld en helt ny tilføjelse til Marvel-universet. Hun spiller den voksne udgave af Ant-Mans datter, Cassie, som denne gang slås side om side med sin farmand. Jeg tror, at du skal have en normal liv. Dad, en guy dressed like a bee tried to kill me in my room when I was six. Daddy, is that you? Hi, Peanut. Newton er et relativt ubeskrevet blad, men som teenager gjorde hun det godt i den fjerde Paranormal Activity-film. Front door, open. Mom? Og så var hun decideret fantastisk i horror-nyklassikeren Freaky, hvor i hun spillede en gymnasieelev, hvis krop blev overtaget af en midaldrende mandlig CM-order. Og så talte vi også med selveste Michael Douglas, en vaskeægte levende legende, som selvfølgelig ikke behøver nogen introduktion. Og Douglas spiller igen den oprindelige Ant-Man, Hank Pym. Your career is so amazing, so distinguished. Again, so many of the pearls in my collection are with you. I mean, some of the stuff you've done throughout your career, you know, shot a bazooka in Los Angeles, chased treasures in Colombia, ruined Wall Street <laughs> twice. I couldn't help but wonder, after doing all that sort of stuff, does it still surprise you when you read a script and it says, you have to pilot a futuristic spaceship while battling a floating <laughs> flying head in an armored metal suit? <laughs> No, it's taken me a while from from the first of these Ant Man shows to realize to realize that truthfully anything is possible, anything, and so I, I just I sit and watch and wonder. You don't really see, you know, the scripts don't really come to you until about three weeks before we start shooting. They, they're always working on re remakes and all of this to get some idea, but uh, this one of the Quantum Mania. The idea of 90% of a movie being shot in, in another world, uh, another planet, with other beings and everything else, uh, is really extraordinary. And they, and they did a spectacular job. And for me, even being involved in the picture, having no sense until you went to the theater uh, to see some of your supporting actors, I'm thinking of the bar scene, for instance, when there were, yeah, some of them were in makeup, and but other ones were created... Um, they were holding poles to give you some idea of their, their size and the immensity of them. Uh, like like the broccoli man, for one. Holy That guy looks like broccoli. 
uh, and the imagination just you know runs wild. I mean, it runs wild. So you're open to expecting anything. There are beings down here, intelligent beings. I always theorized it was possible, but to be here, a subatomic universe. In a film like this, like you say, 90% of it takes place in this quantum realm. So much of it is, is created later. It makes me wonder, how do you feel like the mechanics of blockbuster filmmaking has changed over the years? Like compared to like a movie like Romancing the Stone, where so right. much of it, of course, is, is tactile and real. How has it changed for you? Well, this is a whole, this is why I wanted to do it, because I had never done a, uh, a, a green screen movie before. All of my movies were, were based on contemporary times and any action sequences and everything were in, in real action time or were created physically in front of the camera, uh, not uh, digitally uh, afterwards. So it was, it's, it's, a, it's a different style of acting. It's a different um, way to, to go about it. Uh, and it did take some, some practice. You, you have to just have the confidence in your director, like in this case, Peyton Reed, because there's a lot of things you're doing where there is nothing around or just the minuscule amount. And especially, you know, the, the, a lot of these scenes always require edge of your seat sort of tension or thrill. Yet sometimes you're trying to convince the actor in you to really go there or you think you're afraid you look, you look like a fool. You know, but um, once you get into it and realize, no, no, they're they're right. You got to trust them a little bit. You have to go against your own feelings, and um, it's 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 a reality. And certainly, right now, thank goodness for these uh, these action pictures, because that seems to be what's saving our movie theaters uh, yeah. at this time. So, be that as it may. We'll stop them together. I got really lucky because two of the sets that I worked on, which was a large chunk of the movie for me, were in a stage called The Volume, which is um, a stage where all the walls and ceiling are covered with thousands of LED screens that are projecting exactly what is actually happening, what you're actually seeing in the scene. So I would step onto stage and I would literally step into the quantum realm. Visually, it was all around me. It was magical. It was enchanting. It was really like more like playing than working because I didn't have to do all the work of imagining the world. I didn't have to do the work of trying to picture the ship coming down or the creature coming across. It was all there. And I couldn't help but, but wonder, so here in Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania, Obviously, you're crash landing in a dangerous, isolated world that's riddled with mysteries. Time is acting really weird, and it doesn't really seem to be a, an immediate escape. Why does this keep happening to you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're not like somebody else also said to me. I, it seems like you have over commitment issues. Like every project you take <laughs> on is this enormous, long, epic thing. You did Lost, and then The Hobbit, and then Marvel, and even my children's book series that I write is 20 books long. And they're like, well, do you ever do anything small, just a quick little <laughs> job? I'm like, no, I, I don't know how. I've gotten to be a part of some very iconic franchises, and I'm very, oh, yeah. very grateful. On my 42nd birthday, I was doing a scene with Michelle Pfeiffer, Michael Douglas, and Bill Murray. I was taken totally by surprise by the fact that I've you've never done a movie before with Bill Murray. I've, I would imagine like the two of you legends had been together in, in movies before, but but no, how, how did you guys click? <laughs> You know, it was great. Well, Bill was in for a short time. It's always a question of how you click with Bill. Uh, he's he's he is is a unique uh, unique individual. But yeah, no, it's it's great. I'm a big fan of his. Also, Michelle, though Michelle Pfeiffer, I hadn't worked with Michelle before the second one. But yeah, well, you 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 sort of try to find those uh, those those comparisons or where you do know each other from. I mean, I knew Bill from his Saturday Night Live days from a long time ago. Hello, I'm Bill Murray. Uh, you can call me Billy, but uh, around here everybody just calls me the new guy. I watch and wonder because I, I love his, his freedom in front of the camera. Uh, some people, Jack Nicholson reminded me of that. There's some people who actually are more open and freer in front of a camera than they are in, in real life. And, and, and I think Bill is one of those people too. I can rewrite existence and shatter timelines. I don't care who this guy is. I just lost so much. He can give us a second chance. I just want to say I'm so impressed by 
how you managed to make this being. I mean, it's a time traveling, universe traveling bad guy. Yeah. And you managed to take him down to earth and make him believable and sort of human. Yeah. You're an interesting man. Scott Lang. But how as an actor do you even start to contemplate how do I inhabit a, a practically immortal being whose mission it is to destroy the whole universe and make him believable? Whoa, bro, that's a huge question. But but I think the answer is I don't I didn't think about that part. You know, I didn't think about the multiverse or any of that, you know, at first. Of course, it has to be taken into account. But first, I was thinking, what is he? Who is he? And the, and the beautiful thing about it is he's you and me. You know, Kang the Conqueror is first and foremost a human being. And mm. then he has all these other uh, accoutrements that make him, you know, th that guy. You know, it makes him him, as it were. Um, and so I looked at that conquering archetype. You know, I looked at what would make somebody do that. Just anybody, any individual. What would make you get to that point with that much aggression, with that much heartbreak, with that much loss, fear? You know, what would make you do that? And, and just dug into that and then connected to my scene partners, which is, which is quite easy to do because they're so human, as it were. Who are you? Just a man who's lost a lot of time, like you. But we can help each other with that. I think also for me, one of the amazing things about your performance is also how you managed to make Kang so scary and intimidating, but also by having him being so quiet and reserved. You sense yeah. all that power and that anger simming beneath the surface. And yeah. I guess, is that also intimidating as an actor? Because I guess it's it's easier to just shout, I'm a bad guy, I'm pissed, I want to do bad guy things. But yeah. to believe in yourself that you could do it in a more quiet, reserved way, that must that must be a challenge. Well, all the whole, I mean, it is a challenge, you know, um, and all the homework is just to make him as dense. I think what you're describing, I hope what you're describing is the density of the character. You know, you go, there is so much going on in this guy, you know, and a lot of that I can I can hand off to Bill Pope, you know, our our director of photographer who who of photography who was who really just had a way of lighting and, and shooting things and and yes he was Kang is so dense, you know what I mean, that there's a certain level of curiosity that I was trying to incite in the audience. Why is he all of that's there. There's a there's a sense of humor there. There's a there's a loss there. There's a gravity to him that comes from someone who literally understands and controls time, in such a way. You know, um, yeah. That I mean that you're commenting on you know the invisible work, which I'm I'm happy about. You're out of your league, Ant Man. A part of your work that definitely isn't invisible is in the, the fight scene that you have Paul Rudd. You're definitely not pulling any punches there. I was just wondering, no, not at all. did any of you end up with any real bruises? Hopefully not. Uh, no, no, that's that's Creed Three. Those are real bruises there. Uh, wow. But but this one, this one, this one, not so much. I mean, Paul's an Avenger, and he's been fighting, you know, for almost a decade now. A decade, I'm sure. So no, I mean, I I think taking the I I did any stunt they would allow me to do. And most stunts they wouldn't allow me to do, I did. You know what I mean? So a lot of my bumps and bruises happened in like the throwing or some of the harness work. But uh, no, with me and Paul, it was very much uh, a choreographed violent ballet. Um, cool. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. But that's the point yeah. though, because you, when you first saw, you're my first interview of the day, so I'm just unloading. Uh, in that, in oh, the, it's perfect. Yeah, yeah. In, <laughs> in the beginning, you see this quiet, um, perhaps menacing figure, and it's morsel by morsel by morsel. You watch him break, 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 crack open, crack open, crack open, until he becomes, he, he literally tells you who he is. You think you can beat me? I am Kang! You know, I am Kang, right? Yeah. That, is, that is the highest point of him. It's over with now. You've brought it here. There's no, now, now I've unleashed now. You know what I mean? Um, but it is the morsels of that, and, and it's at the height, I think, uh, when we're fight, when, when uh, Scott and Kang face off officially. Okay, I have a suit. Yeah, I noticed. You okay? Yes. Look, momentum, right? Jump tap, right? One move, jump tap. I know how to do it, Dad. Oh, do you? Yes. Really? Because it didn't look like it from I my end. I messed up on the timing. Jump. Ah. Like that. You see what I did? You see what I did? No. 
You're like this small. Catherine is such a blessing <laughs> to talk to you. Actually, there's no way you'll remember this. I actually talked to you 10 years ago on Paranormal Activity 4 on, oh my God. on Skype. Such a long time ago. You did? Wow. Did the directors ever play any sounds or music during the set just to give you a sense of, of what it would be like afterwards? Yes, they used to use a huge bass drum. And they would never tell me when they were going to use it. And they used to get like a really good jump scare out of me. <sighs> what was that? And then almost every time after they used to they'd be like, Catherine, can you not be so scared this time? I'd be like, maybe you shouldn't use that drum this time. <laughs> and also, I got to say, I mean, as you can see, I have a huge movie library. I'm a... I'm a huge movie fan. I just wanted to pick out just one of my recent favorites, which is Freaky, <gasps> oh, because I think you. it's one of the best horror movies in years. I, oh, I, I it so must have been such a blast to get to play, you know, an aging serial killer in a high school student's body. That must have been it so. It was, sweet. and I was thinking about being a superhero while making that movie. I was like, all right, you're practicing your run. How would you run if you were a superhero? I was like preparing for this role, even though I didn't know I had this role yet. There was just something in me that was like, get ready. I knew it was coming. It all made sense. It oh, made sense. Well, that's so, now I'm so just... cool that you've known me since Paranormal Activity. Wow. That was my first lead of a of a movie, like the lead. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Crazy. And I actually couldn't help but wonder about Paranormal Activity while watching it, just in terms of the fact that in that film, of course, you also have to imagine all these forces around you, whether it be uh, ghosts, demons, whatever. And in this film, of course, where you're in the quantum realm, it's very much the same thing. There are all these weird creatures that you don't get to see until you watch the final film. So did you right. draw on that, you know, your experience in, in professional make-believe? Oh, absolutely. I think what I took the most from Paranormal Activity was telling a story with just your eyes, right? Yeah. There's not a lot of dialogue in a horror film, really. It's like mostly around you what's happening and then you see it happening to the character. And then in a Marvel movie, there's nothing going on around me, right? There's just green screen or whatever world I'm in. I have to imagine it. So you have to tell the story, push the story forward with just your face because I'm looking at nothing. I got to go with what's going to happen. I have to trust my director and trust Paul and just feel ridiculous acting <laughs> to nothing. And um, so the funny, the funny thing is, is the process of making these movies is the same as as, you know, Paranormal Activity 4. It's just a much bigger trailer, and the food is yeah. better. <laughs> it's like we're camping. We've never been camping. But we've always talked about it. I would never be able to keep a straight face around Paul Rudd. No. Uh, I mean, how difficult is that? No, there's no way. You're already smiling too much as it is. You would never get through a moment with him. <laughs> but I swear, yeah, exactly. You are a great reflection of what I actually look like in between takes and during takes. <laughs> I broke in every single scene I thought I was going to get fired. There was one day I was looking at, I looked at Paul and I'm like, Paul, like this has to stop. I'm not doing a good job. Like I'm making cuts. And he said, no, don't feel bad. He's like, the truth is, is if you and I are laughing and creating an energy and having chemistry like this, the audience is going to feel it. And that's what they're going to take away. We're still saying the lines. He's like, you're getting through it. There's this magical thing called editing. And he's right. <laughs> I think it's kind of like if you and I go to a concert and the band plays their song and then in the middle of the song, they just start jamming. Now we're all part of like a new experience that's better than what was just planned. It's better than what was just on the page. And that happened because our director, Peyton Reed, really encouraged it. You know, it was really cool that on the biggest project of my life, <laughs> I was encouraged to like try stuff and fail and take a risk. And um, that was different than what I thought it was gonna be. I thought it was gonna be more like stand on your mark, say your line. But Peyton Reed wanted us to improvise, not because he wanted to use it particularly, but because he wanted us to have that energy together. And I, I think you feel it. I can get you hope. And give you more time. If you help me, Hi, Michael. Hello, Johan. How are you? Wow. Is that your library behind you? That is my movie library. Wow. About 3,000 movies. And I got to say, a lot of these films have you in front of the camera or you as a producer. Yeah. Some of the most treasured movies in my collection have it's been made by incredible you. Incredible library. I am so jealous. Really? Yes, awesome. that's so cool. I am like paranoid about the fact that everything that you get media wise now has to be rented. In other words, the subscription service thing. I really yeah. have anxiety about this. I want to own 
my music. I want to own my movies. I don't want to borrow yeah. them and have to give them back or have them yeah. suddenly be not accessible to me because I stopped paying a monthly payment. I'm looking exactly. at your wall going, you have <laughs> your own personal Netflix. Yeah, it's a uh, cornucopia of kingdom, it appears. Oh, that's a great title for it. That's a you, great title. You, you can have that. that. You, uh, you can yeah, have yeah, it. Yeah. It's for you. I was just talking about how I want to go to Denmark. Awesome. You totally <laughs> should. You've never been here? No, I haven't. And I just had an interview with somebody else from Denmark, and I was like, God, that guy, he's from Denmark, huh? He's a nice guy. I think I want to go there. I think I want to <laughs> have a good time. And I was like, let's see, this next journalist is from Denmark. I'm like, let's see, he's probably going to be really cranky. And you are even nicer. So you are really, you guys, <laughs> look, you're so cute. You guys are really making a, me want to visit. And I hope it's not 10 years from now. Next movie. Exactly. And thank, thanks for watching nice Freaky. One.